to achieve that. Um, and you're welcome to do it regardless of, of whether you think you need extra credit or not. It would be a good exercise to do. Um, so go for it. Um, let's take a, a brief look at what we did last time and then we'll go on to our next example that's a little more involved. Um, all right. Boy, I wish we don't need... I, I don't like having these cameras. I mean, I see my hair all a mess and all that. I actually... Uh, I actually was watching a program on my DVR and I somehow didn't realize it was on my DVR and I thought I was watching it, you know, actually on the TV show, you know, on, on the network and, and um, when it was getting ready to wrap up I was thinking, oh it must be 7.30, you know. Well actually it wasn't 7.30, it was like 20 to 8, you know, so I kind of had to hustle to get here. So. Uh, I do feel a little bit frazzled, but, but we'll get past this. All right. And if you remember last time, we had a GUI example that had a, a simple text box and a button, and we were able to go in and calculate uh, converting centigrade to Fahrenheit or vice versa. I forget which. And let's go in and take a brief look at it. All right, here it is. We put it in centigrade, click convert, and we get the temperature in Fahrenheit. If we're going to look at this, what we have is, let, let, let's look at the, the main pieces of this again. If we look at this, we have our imports to import those swing and AWT classes, which are the classes responsible for the GUI. Swing being sort of an evolution from AWT. Um, we have our class first GUI, which extends JFrame, so it's going to be the main frame for our application, and it implements Action Listener, which means that in addition to being the window, it's also going to contain the code um, to process when the button is pressed. I create my four components, the label, the text field, the button, and the label for the results. My main method simply creates a new instance of this, which of course fires off the constructor. And the constructor sets the default close operation to say exit the program when you close the window creates a panel. Remember, we're going to put our controls on panel on, on a panel, then we're going to put the panel on the frame. <coughs> we add to the button, or we, we call a method on the button to set its action listener. And the action listener is um, the, the, the event handler, the code that gets fired off when that button is clicked. And in this case, since everything's all in this one class, and because this class implements the action listener interface, we can make this class itself handle when the button is clicked. So long as we implement this function, this method, the, the only method in the action listener interface is action performed. And some parameters are passed to it that says other sorts of stuff. All right, so we say, hey, this object, oh, I'm sorry, this class is going to handle when the button is pressed. Another word, way to say that is, the action perform method on this class is going to get fired off when we press the button. We add our four components to that panel. We put that panel on the frame. We set the size of the frame. We set it visible and we're good to go. When the user clicks on the button, this code goes into effect that pulls attributes out of the form, does some sort of calculation, sets the results, uh, unless there's an exception, in which case it, it displays an error message. So the key points in here are the different swing components that we put on a panel. We put the panel on the, on the frame. The frame, the, the fact that this class extends JFrame, the fact that this class's static main method creates an instance of itself. All right. Um, and the fact that we have an action listener involved. An action listener is an interface and it has the action perform method as its only method. And in this case, 
The frame itself is the action listener, so it does the code, it contains the code and, and executes the code when the button is pressed. Okay. Question about any of that? Yes? So it doesn't really say anything about pressing the button? Mm -hmm. is, it, is there anything like in JavaScript, for example, where there's like different things that you could do, for example, on Mozilla? Like um, that's a good question. Let's take a look at, at it. I believe it's if they interact with the button on in any way. So let's, for example, let's go in and press space. That does the same thing. So there must be certain uh, events that, that correspond to it being pressed. So it doesn't literally have to be an on click. It's if you've interacted with it. All right. That, that that's uh, enough. All right. Okay. The... Second example, I think we just looked at it. We didn't look at the code at all, but we just looked at it because we had a bit of a cliffhanger. And the cliff cliffhanger was this. We have two buttons here. Can we do this all in one class? Can we make, how can we make this in one class? What, how can we handle the event handler? And the other one it was easy because we could make that, um, we could make that class the, the action listener and it could handle the button as well as displaying the frame. Now we have two buttons to do. What, what are we going to do? How can we handle this? Yes? Could try overloading them? Could try overloading them? Um, that's a good thought. We can't though because the interface only supports that one method. All right, not a, an overloaded version of the method. So that, that's a good thought. We could have the same event handler for both buttons and write code that's smart enough to figure out what button got pressed and do different things. But I don't like that. I don't like that because that doesn't seem to me to be a very, uh, uh, how do I want to say it? Stylistically, I don't think that's good. As a general rule, uh, when you're creating a function, describe briefly what the function does. In this case, we don't have the opportunity to name the function. A lot of times you say, give the function a name. But I guess just as well is you could say, well, give a brief description of what the function does. And if I were to say, handles when button one, and handles when button 2 is pressed. If my description contains the word and, it's probably not a good function, <laughs> right? Because then it does two things. And it's better programming practice to um, just do what you, what you need to do. So um, in, in one function and not try to combine two pieces of functionality into one function. So it's better stylistically in my mind to have two functions, one to handle the first button, one to handle the second button. Well, how do we do that? Obviously, the answer involves we have to involve another class in here. All right? We have to involve another class to be the action listener. All right? Now, let's think that through, though. You know what's real nice about this code? This is the original one that, that we looked at. What's real nice about this is this class is the frame and it's also the action listener. This action listener can access all the instance variables in that frame, right? It can access the text box, it can access the labels, it can access anything on that frame. If we made a separate class altogether, then we have the problem of how do we get everything from this frame into that class to be handled, all right? So, it's a little bit of a, uh, of a trick, if you will, and fortunately, there's a, a kind of clever solution for it, and that is by what's called an inner class, okay? If you didn't take day one of Java, <laughs> or you maybe you just got introduced classes of Java, and someone said, you know, we're going to talk about inner classes today, you know, you'd think, what does that mean? Well, it probably means a class inside a class, right? Or, you know... Uh, class in, inside another class or something like that. And that's exactly what an inner class is. So the inner class allows us 
to access the instance variable of the parent class, the instance variables. So we don't have to worry about passing to that inner class um, the text boxes and buttons and radio buttons and all that because it can access them. Now, you might say to yourself, well, I'm not really crazy about that because that limits the reusability of that inner class. Well, that inner class isn't meant to be reusable. That inner class is an event handler that's handling uh, a particular event on a particular window. That's UI code. It shouldn't be doing any heavy duty processing. If anything, it should be creating some of these business logic classes that we have, you know, like our trip class, our car class, our rock, paper, scissors class, whatever class. It should be creating them, all right, and uh, calling methods on them. So it's not really doing any what you call business logic or any real work. If anything, it's a traffic director. It's just sort of coordinating. It's gathering up all the input that it needs, calling the appropriate functions, displaying the results, displaying if there's any exceptions. So the fact that this code isn't reusable, uh, the fact that this class exists inside another class and therefore isn't available to the outside world, I'm not particularly bothered with. All right. Um, it's almost, for those of you that have done ASP, uh, ASP.NET, it's almost like talking about the code behind file. I don't really care that the code behind file I can't reuse because there's nothing in there worth reusing. All right? It's just sort of the glue between my user interface and my business logic classes. All right, so let's go look at the second example. And I actually... The second example I did two different ways. I have two buttons and I handled each one of them uh, a different way. And you can almost see, you know, no you can't because I don't have the projector on. Assuming I have the projector on, you can almost see that something odd's going on here, right? Because I have one Java file and I have three class files. Ooh, something weird's going on there. And What's more, these three class files have goofy names. <laughs> All right. This one is called first GUI dollar sign one dot class. That doesn't even really look like it has a name, right? The second one kind of has a name. First GUI dollar sign C2F class. Well, as you can imagine, the classes, the class files that contain the dollar sign as part of their name are the inner classes. They're code that's defined inside of the first GUI. And the one with the dollar sign one that doesn't even really have a name is what's called an anonymous class. All right, it doesn't have a name, it's anonymous. All right, and the other one is, is just a plain old inner class. So let's look how I achieve this. All right, some of this should be familiar to you, all right? In addition, what I do is I, I import a class for the border layout. If you remember in the previous example, I really didn't do anything with the layout. I added the things to the panel and they just got added sequentially to that panel, boom, 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 one after another, all right? Here I'm importing in a border layout class which is a class that gives me more control over the way that the items on the, on the, on the window are, are laid out. All right. I then have very similar thing as the other one, except I have an extra button to convert Fahrenheit to centigrade. My main method likewise creates a uh, creates an instance of itself, creates an instance of first GUI. And now I go in and set the default close operation. We're not going to worry right this minute about what I'm doing with two panels here. All right, we'll just forget about that for now. All right, what I'm doing now in essence, is I'm doing the same thing I did before. I'm adding the different controls to panels, and then I'm adding the panels to the window. All right. 
We'll worry about the details of that later on. We're in effect doing the same thing, we're just doing it in a more involved way. All right, so let's not worry about the layout. That's, that's the least of our worries tonight. All right? Now, what am I doing here? My first button, centigrade to Fahrenheit, I'm adding an action listener. And what is that action listener? I'm creating a new C2F uh, object. And if we look, notice that and this is where the curly brackets become critical. Notice that that is contained within the bigger class. So the class declaration is truly inside the big class. All right? The big class starts up here and goes to here. This inner class declaration is here. All right? So it truly is an inner class. And it's named C to F. Well, we kind of predicted that we were going to have a inner class named C to F. Well, that's the class file for that. All right? And we know it's inner because it says first GUI dollar sign C to F. Now, what do we know about that? Well, we know that it has to implement the action listener. All right? And by virtue of that, we know that it has to have an action performed event. Other than that, the code's the same as it was on, on the other page. It's just we moved it from inside the frame class itself to an inner class within the frame class. And again, because this is an inner class, all right, because this is an inner class, it has access to all these instance variables of that class. If I were to move this, let me, let me move this, that one will be easier. If I were to move this so it was out of, not declared inside of it, I'm going to get a compile error, at least one. All right. It gives me that error for a, a different reason. But notice, these are the relevant errors. It tells me it doesn't know what txt temp is. doesn't know what LBL results are. All right, why? Because now it's not part of that class. So I have to declare it inside that class. Now if I go and compile it, it works. All right. Now it can see without any difficulty the instance variables that are declared on the class that contains it, the frame. So it can see all of these. Now, any questions about that? Good, that's the easy one. This is a hard one. This is an anonymous class. Now again, do keep in mind that, that this example is just uh, for demonstration purposes. I probably wouldn't really code it this way. I would code it consistently. In other words, I've created my inner classes the two different ways that I can create inner classes. Just to demonstrate, there are two different ways that you can do it, and this is how you do it if you do it one way, this is how you do it if you do the other way. That doesn't mean you should do that too. It'd probably be better to do it consistently. So if you like the inner class with a name, you do that. If you like the anonymous classes, do two of those. All right. Notice what we have here. BTN FC, so the other buttons, action listener equals new action listener. So it's not a class that I've made. I'm just making a new action listener. And I'm putting my function declaration right here. All right. I'm sorry, not function definition, class definition. I'm putting my class definition right here. New action listener, and I have the code there. And because it is an action listener, all right, I have to implement the action perform method just like I did for the other one. But all the code's in here, all right. This is the anonymous class. Why? Because we never gave it any name. I didn't do like I did down here and said public class such and such. 
I simply said, hey, I want to make a new class that's of type action listener, and this is the method that I have in it so that I implement that interface. Now, if given the choice, I don't really like this. Why do you think I don't like this? Was that an answer to my question or, or, or what? I didn't hear what they said. That very well might have been a valid answer. Why don't I like this? Put differently, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah. I would say if you compare this line of code with this line of code, simple, complicated. <laughs> All right. This is real easy to read. All right. This, uh, you know, I guess once you uh, understand what's going on here, it's not really a mystery, but it seems a little harder to read. Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, again, uh, Android is, is Java-based. So, you know... Um, oh, it, it starts it for you? Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Whatever I... Uh, is that using Eclipse or some other ID? Okay. So, if anything... That's not to say, by the way, that you couldn't do it this way even using that, right? Um, it just might take you down a, a certain path. Um, what do they say? It is, uh, it's a poor carpenter that blames a hammer or something like that. Um, in my, it's my belief you try to write the best code you can. And um, if that means sort of bucking the, bucking the direction of the, the IDE and, and going a little bit against what it, the path is going to lead you down, then, then I'm all for that. For example, um, just to give other, uh, other similar examples, you know, um, Visual Studio, I think, does a horrible job with, like, uh, a layout on, uh, on HTML pages. You're better off doing it yourself as opposed to trying to use that tool to do that. And likewise, Dreamweaver generates some really ugly code and, and, and all that. So, at any rate, yeah, it's a point well taken, but I, I guess what I'm saying is, if you're going into, and if you're like reading books to see examples, or if your job is to maintain someone else's code, you should at least see the both ways to do it, so that you know what it is when you run into it. All right? I don't really care which way you do it, which way makes more sense to you, I'm fine with, um, but there's two ways that you can do it. And of course, when we do this, we get this where we can go and type that in and click this button, that code gets handled, click this button, that code gets handled. The important things I want to wanna stress is, number one, in my mind it's good to have a separate action listener for each button. You could do it otherwise. I was actually... I was pretty sure that you could. I, I wasn't exactly sure of the logistics because I've always done it this way. But I did a quick Google and you can like tell based on these, based on properties, what button got hit and then you could go and you can do different things depending on that. In my mind that's probably not stylistically quite as good a code as having a separate event handler for each. Between these two, I, I guess it's largely a matter of personal preference. Um, I guess I would favor this one, but if you told me you favor this one, I guess I'm not going to argue with you. All right? Just be able to recognize both of them. Key thing to remember, though, is both of these are inner classes. Right? And the big reason for that is that both of these, it's nice if they can access the main frames instance variables. All right. I suppose you could have some other class handle it, but then you're going to have the issue of getting to that class 
all the different uh, instance variables, which you probably could do, but it sounds too much like work. All right. Um, both of these implement the action listener method, and therefore both of these have that um, that method in it uh, to handle the respective things. Um, I, I guess that's it about those action listeners, unless you have other questions. All right. All right. Now, let's see what I'm doing with the layout. We said we were going to forget about the layout for now. Um, now it's time to go and actually look at the layout. What I have uh, is, is two panels. I have two panels. All right. P and P2. All right. Notice I haven't noticed that we're going we're gonna to peek ahead in the code a bit. All right. Notice that I've done something with the layout for the panel P, but I haven't done anything for the panel P2. What does that imply? That implies the stuff that I put in panel two are just going to get put boom, boom, right next to each other. All right. So if we could draw this, let's draw this as we execute the code. Here's our window. Here's P1. Here's P2, and what we're going to do with these. All right. These two lines of code say add the two buttons to P2. So what do we do? We put the two buttons in P2. So now we have the two buttons in P2. For P, we set the layout to a new border layout. Remember, that was a guy that we imported up here. Now, what on earth does that mean? Let's go and let's take a look at, at that. I guess this is as good as any. Let's try to see. When we do border layout, our page is divided into five areas. Now these are these are giving um, the areas a different name. If you notice in my code example, I say north, center, east, and south. All right. Since these are constants, they probably have two sets of constants that refer to it. In this case, they call it page south, or page start, line start, center, line end, page end. All right. The idea is the same. Your panel, if you use a border layout, is divided into five sections. And using the, the, the code example I use, this would be the north, this would be the south, this would be the west, this would be the east, and this would be the center. Using their terminology, in this example, this would be page underscore start, page underscore and, line start, 
line and. Now what is the significance of this? The significance of this is we can start popping things in these different areas. Alright, we've defined these areas. We can start uh, putting things in here. So let me redraw an empty copy of P1 with the five sections. Alright, if we look at our code then, I'm adding to the north section label temp. So label temp gets put in here. Alright. I'm adding in the center section text temp. So my text box goes here. I'm adding, oops, label goes in north, text box in the center. In the east goes P2. So in the east, I put that whole panel too. But that panel itself is a component that I can put on other panels, right? Nest these things. So panel two goes here with its two buttons. All right, panel two goes there with the two buttons. And then finally, I put border layout south, I put label results. So my results go here, my label for the results. Now notice I didn't put anything in the west, so that sort of collapses. I also didn't take great care about sizing these things, so therefore, looks kind of goofy with a gigantic text box in the middle uh, and, and so on. Now I believe, based on this, that I could, instead of saying, using these terms, I could say, instead of north, I could say I should be able to say page start. And I should be able to do that and have it work. Sure enough, it does. What can we, oh. What can we infer from that? We can infer from that that those two constants have the same value. Right? And those two constants probably have some value of one or, you know, or zero or whatever. Well, they, there's two constants that both have those same values. So we can use this one or that one. Use whichever one you learned, makes sense, however you want to put it. Again, I would suggest being consistent though. If I'm going to say north, I'm going to say then southeast, west, and center. If I'm going to say page start, I'm going to say page end, pay, uh, line start, line end. All right. So that in a nutshell is how I've gotten this layout. And again, with, with more work and with more tweaking of parameters, we could get um, sort of a different look uh, if we wanted to. Oops. All right. Now, I have some code commented out that I will uncomment. And I will comment out, I'll move the comments to comment out this set of code. So I'll comment out the, the, the border layout and I'll do a box layout. Now the box layout is where things simply get laid out one thing after another. All right. This one though, because it's with the y-axis, is going to be oriented vertically, as opposed to the default, which is oriented horizontally. So, if I go and compile this, what I will get is the things, this is a label, this is the text box, there's my two buttons, and there is the results label. I put something in, I get my answer there. If 
I did this, it's more or less the default, right? It's going to orient them horizontally and we're back to sort of the way that the very first example looked, except we have um, um, two buttons over in this panel. My guess is I didn't set any size for that panel too, so that's why it made that panel big. That's why it's making a gigantic text box. I think you should understand how this works, the basics of the layout, but how do I want to put this? I'm not going to be too much of a perfectionist if you're hand coding it to get the layout to look a certain way, right? Because, you know, that's why you have IDEs. That's where an IDE actually starts to become nice because, you know, it can do some of those things pretty easy for you. But you should understand the basics of it and you should understand how it works, you know. Um, I always think it's important to know, um, you know, how something works before you use a tool to do it. So you should know how to add before you use a calculator uh, and so on down the line. All right. Questions about any of this? Now, the one thing where both of these examples, I guess if I was going to criticize them um, in any way, the, the drawback of both of these examples is that the action listener actually contains um, um, meaningful code. It contains you know, what I would call business logic. Not that there's too many businesses whose business is to convert centigrade to Fahrenheit and Fahrenheit to centigrade, but you know, substitute calculating a shipping cost or calculating sales tax or something like that. That probably, that sort of calculation that you could see happening across your application should live in a class by itself somewhere. All right? Maybe that's a static method on, a, uh, on some other kind of object. I don't know, you know, uh, in, in this case, a conversion one. Maybe you have a conversion class that has a static method of convert Fahrenheit to centigrade and centigrade to Fahrenheit. All right? But the idea is, is Really what we're writing now is we're writing our GUI code, which is taking the place of the test code that we wrote before because it's doing the job of gathering the input, calling the method, and displaying the results. All right? These kind of functions like this, oops, like this, really shouldn't do any of the work itself. And I would characterize this line of code as work. All right? That should be in a class somewhere. All right? But again, this is being the first example. Um, you know, it, it seemed easy enough to do it that way. Um, now, if you're going to go and take and, and attempt the extra credit exercise, what you'll do is you'll create a GUI like this, and you will then at this point create instances of your different classes call the appropriate methods on them, call the appropriate constructors, do your thing, get the results, and display them. Remember, the job of this kind of function, of the action listener, is simply to gather the input from the form, right? From, from the, the, the frame, from the UI. Do any formatting or maybe some validation if you want. All right, uh, if you need to do it. Then call the appropriate, what I would call business logic methods, all right, on the appropriate business logic classes. And then display the results. So in a way, and here's a chance for you to insert your favorite boss joke uh, that you want, all right. But in a way, this is like a boss function, all right. Bosses don't do anything themselves, right? Bosses simply, you know, sort of run the show, sort of coordinate things. They don't necessarily do any of the grunt work themselves. 
So, in this case, the role of this boss function, again, role of these boss functions in general, are to gather the input that you need, call the appropriate method or methods, and then display the result. All right? That's kind of what these do. All right? So, therefore, this code should typically be very simple, right? Because there's not going to be any kind of complicated calculations going on in here. Those belong in your business classes. Those belong in those other classes that we've talked about most of this, uh, most of the, most of this semester. All right? So again, in our case for the rock, paper, scissors one, this is where you would create the instances of those classes and set the appropriate... Uh, this is effectively, all right, if you want to think about it, where you would put your test case code. Except instead of hard coding in, that you're taking a trip that's 500 miles and you're taking a, uh, a, a four-wheel drive vehicle and you're staying overnight in a five-star hotel. Instead of hard coding that into your test class, you're getting those parameters to create your, your objects and, 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 and set the properties. You're getting those from your GUI. All right? So that's the role that this method performs. This method really shouldn't do work on its own. All right. And, uh, another way to put it is anything that you could imagine being reusable shouldn't be there. This is throwaway code. This is code that exists in this particular instance just to glue this together, to glue this frame together to the rest of our app, to our business level classes. So anything that you might think you want to reuse probably don't belong in there. All right. Questions at this point? All right, rarity of rarities, I'm done, and I still have a couple minutes left. I hope you forgive me. I hope you take some of those extra minutes I did other weeks and apply them to this, and you still think you're getting more than your money's worth. So, we'll see you in lab. <laughs>